down at your feet Cause you're the only one I need I turn to you and you were always there In troubled times it's you I seek I put you first, that's all I need I humble all I am, all to you Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You're always, always there, everyhow and everywhere. Your grace abounds so deep within. Today the same Forever to forever Means no end One way Jesus You're the only one That I could live for One way Jesus You're the only one That I could live for One way Jesus for you we live in all for you you are the way the truth and the life we live by faith and not by sight for you we live in all for you Many men will take the rain and turn to thank the clouds. Many men will hear you speak, they will never turn round. But I will not forget you, oh my God, my King, with a thankful heart.
Since you found me, I've never been on my own when fear surrounds me. In you, I find my home. You are my home. Since the day you changed me.
search the world But it couldn't fill me Lands empty praise Treasures and faith I never know And you came Turn bones into armies. 
Jesus, we thank you for this day. Thank you that you want to speak to us. Thank you that you're our Father and that you're good and you want to do good in us. You want to do good things in our life. You want to do good through us. And I ask that we would just surrender to you today, that we would understand the plans you have for us are good. Even if we don't see your promises fulfilled right away, we know that you're good and we know that you are good on your word to us. And I just ask that we would continue to trust in you, that we would continue to focus on you and to surrender more to you today. Have your way in this service and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. Let me see if I can get all the announcements right. <laughs> I don't have a paper in front of me, so I actually have to depend on my mind, which is a difficult thing these days, it's called old age. Anyway, uh, today is a day of prayer for our nation and fasting for those that feel like that's what God wants them to do. Um, if you didn't, if you didn't know about this, Franklin Graham called the nation to prayer for our nation. Uh, he, he picked today as the day to do that. And it's a day of fasting and prayer. And uh, if, if, this is, you know, if this is the first time you heard about it, well, you can start now. It's okay. Um, but I will uh, do a prayer for the nation uh, as we go into the teaching like we, like we always do. We always have a prayer before the teaching. But that'll, I'll lead us in a prayer for the nation as well. Um, this is the fourth Sunday. So that means that the Couples Fellowship is meeting this afternoon at 4. So you can join them at the building. And that's a live in-person meeting. You don't have to bring any food. Surprise, surprise. But uh, just bring yourself your significant other and your Bible. And I think that'll be enough. Uh, speaking of live and in-person, next Sunday, that's right, next Sunday, uh, we're going to have live and in-person service at Grace Fellowship at the building. Uh, if you're ill, uh, please don't come. But we're going to check people's temperature at the door, make sure you bring your mask and wear it. Um, worship team members, while you're singing, you don't have, we're, we're separated enough while you're singing. You might give your microphone the COVID, but I don't think you're going to give anybody else. You can take your mask off while you're singing. Um, but you know, let's just be let's just be cautious. We don't have to be afraid. I'm tired of people living in fear. I'm not living in fear. I'm gonna you know, let's get together. People say, well, we're we're, we're worried about you. I'm not worried about me. God will take care of me, and He'll take care of all of us as we as we trust in Him. But if you happen to be somebody who's a, who's a little bit. Um, uneasy that's the word about joining us live because of the the virus and and all that and you want to see how it works out first that's fine you don't have to feel bad about that but uh just realize there's not going to be any worship music on the video and you'll we will kick in live when the teaching starts so just realize that you're, you're not going to have the worship, but maybe you can listen to our CD, you know, while you're waiting for the teaching to come on. So that's happening. And also next Sunday is a communion Sunday. So make sure you got your grape juice and crackers or matzah, uh, whatever you want to use and uh, be ready for communion next week. I think I got it all. Did I get it all? Yes, I think so. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a miracle in and of itself. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> if you have a friend to friend card, take that out. Let's pray for our friends and pray for ourselves as we open up God's word this morning. 
Father, we do thank you for our friends and our family members that haven't yet come to know you. Thank you that you placed people on our hearts to pray for, and we're being diligent to lift them up just like somebody lifted us up um, and we came to know you. Lord, we lift them up to you and ask that wherever they are, whatever they're doing, that you would pour out your spirit on them right now. That you'd pour out your grace and your compassion and your mercy. And that you would do everything in your power to bring them into your kingdom that we could all spend eternity together. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that as we open it up, that you'd help us to open up our hearts to hear from your Holy Spirit. Lord, words are nice that come out of my mouth, but words are better that come out of yours because your words are life. Help us to hear your word today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And Lord, we lift up our country. We have an election going on even right now. Lord, I pray that you would, you know, party doesn't matter. What, happen, what matters is the heart of the person. And Lord, we don't know their heart, but you do. So Lord, I pray that you would lead us to vote for the people that, like David, have a heart after you. Show us who that is as we seek you for our nation. Raise up godly leadership in our nation. Raise up leaders that will listen to you, both local, state, and federal. That we'd have godly men and women representing us in this nation, in our town. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, open up your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to read verses 12 through 19. And you might have noticed me making some signals to Evelyn because uh, the fan, the ceiling fan was on. It was making some noise. So I was doing two things. I was praying and I was trying to get the, the fan turned off. So we got it, we got it done. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with, the, with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. And we'll stop there. Every time I read one of these passages, I have to ask the same question. Isn't it strange that Peter says that we should Rejoice when we're being persecuted. Uh, I, I, when, when people are being mean to me, I don't find that an occasion to rejoice. But actually, when the apostles were beaten by the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts, you can read where it says that they rejoiced that they were, that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. In other words, they weren't complaining. They weren't saying, you know, I was just trying to be an apostle. This is the, this is the thanks I get. You know, they, they didn't do that. And so he's, he's telling us to do the same thing. He's saying that we should rejoice while being persecuted. And many of the writers of the, of the New Testament say the same thing or similar things. 
And Jesus says this about the subject. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, blessed are those who are <coughs> coughing. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Notice, persecuted because of righteousness. Not persecuted for being a bad person. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed. And blessed means, oh, how happy. Anybody feel happy when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me? Be glad and rejoice because your reward is in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, Peter says something interesting here, and I just noticed it um, when I read it again. Um, he says in the 14th verse, if you're ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. See, if we're persecuted for Jesus, the reason we're rejoicing, according to Peter, <coughs> excuse me, is that people are noticing that the Spirit of God is resting on us. And so we're having an effect on the people that we encounter because of the Spirit of God that's moved into our lives. Does that make sense? So the thing about persecution is we think a lot of times, well, I'm going I'm to give my life to Jesus and everything is just going to be hunky-dory for the rest of my life. Well, it doesn't say that anywhere, actually, in the Bible. What it does say, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, the first part of it, we'll read the second part of it in a minute, you will be hated by everyone because of my name. Does that sound fun? I feel blessed. That doesn't sound fun. You're going to be hated by everyone. And I tell you what, right now we're living in a time where Christians are hated all over the world. We didn't, tear, we didn't bring down the World Trade Center. We aren't killing people in a caliphate. We aren't doing any of that, yet we are among the most hated people in the world, Christians. We think crucifixion we think persecution and all those things are something from days gone by. Well, that's because we live in the United States of America. But if you start looking at some of the things that people are bringing up in Congress, it's only a matter of time till Christianity will either be outlawed or severely impeded by the federal government. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 14 says, In fact, this is a fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many of you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Can, can you lift up your hand? I know I can't see you, but God can. And all of us who lifted up our hand, Paul says to Timothy, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, he doesn't even say all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who want to. All of us who want to follow Jesus, because how many of you, while wanting to follow Jesus, have failed from time to time? Can I see your hand? Yeah, you've goofed up, right? You've made a mistake. You committed an oops, which is a sin. It says, uh, look at the 13th verse. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. You know those who taught you. So in the process of, of living a godly life, we're going to be persecuted. But what does he tell us to do? Because he's telling us to Timothy, because Timothy is a bit timid. He's, he's left in the area of Ephesus to be the bishop over the churches in Ephesus, and yet he's a young man. And back then they respected your age. 
They respected elders. Today, you know, most of us grew up in a time when people said, don't trust anybody over 30. Now I look at somebody who's 30 and I'm thinking, they're a kid. But, <laughs> but back then, you know, the young people knew everything. So he's telling us that what we need to do while being persecuted for righteousness, but being persecuted because we want to live a godly life. We want to follow Jesus. So we're being persecuted. What do we do? Continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. See, Satan's trying to knock us off our game. And Paul's saying, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. Jesus says this in John 1633. I've told you these things. Okay, what things? You need to go back and read it, but I'll, I'll summarize. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, I've told you these things. He told them about they're going to be persecuted. They're going to be thrown in prison. Families are going to turn against each other and all that kind of stuff. And he says, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. What? Yeah, I've told you all these terrible things that are going to happen to you so that in me, you can have peace. Well, what does that mean? Well, he goes on to say, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered the world. Oh, that's, that's better. He says, you're going to have suffering, but look, I told you ahead of time so that you could expect it. It's not going to be a surprise to you, although a lot of us are being lulled to sleep and the persecution that's coming will be a surprise to us. I'll tell you, pe people where it's happening already, they're not surprised. Why? Because they live in an area where people hate Christians. But he says, in this world, you'll have suffering. A lot of times we stop there. But he says, be courageous. Another, in another translation, be of good cheer. Or be happy. Uh, don't worry. Be happy. Uh, don't worry. Be happy. Don't worry. Be courageous. Be happy. I have conquered the world. We, we have surrendered to someone who's much bigger than anything that the devil can throw at us. Paul had a problem. He called it a thorn in the flesh. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, he's talking about that. Nope, I'm, I'm mistaken. Ah! <laughs> oh. Live video. Isn't it fun? Um, he's talking about the things that happened to him. And he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. That's basically a death penalty. But you know what? He received the death penalty, didn't die. Um, death penalty was 40 lashes. So what's one more lash with the cat of nine tails? So God spared his life. That's what Jesus was given once because Pilate was trying to kill him an easier way than with crucifixion. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. And there, he heard the music. You have to hear that music when you're swimming in the ocean. Get out of the water. These people in the movies, they never get out of the water in time. Paul apparently got out of the water in time. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. That pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, 
Doom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> Sorry. That's for you country music fans who like hee haw. Um, <laughs> hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concerns for all the churches. So Paul's gone through all of these things, plus he has this concern for all of the churches, all the, all the people that have come to know Jesus under his ministry. You know, when that happens, you are concerned for the people that God put under you. And, and Paul was, and he had all these things that happened to him, beaten and all that stuff, shipwrecked, didn't have any food. And the thing is, when God begins to use you and me, Satan's going to do everything in his power to discourage us. He's going to use anything and anyone. You notice that he's, when he lists the things that were, uh, were happening to him, he says, dangers among false brothers. See, so he was, he was being uh, targeted by people who were saying they were believers, but they were wolves in sheep's clothing, if you will. But the devil's going to use anybody in anything. He's going to bring people in your life that will cozy up to you. And the whole reason they're there is to try to lure you back into your former way of living. Well, personally, I don't want to go there. So I want God to open my eyes to those people. But listen to what it says in Ephesians 6.12. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So my struggle is not against those people that the enemy brings into my life. The, the enemy is the devil. He, he says it here. It's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. What's he talking about? The devil and his demon buddies. That's our enemy. We have to keep that in the forefront of our mind. Otherwise, we're going to be having fights with people who aren't really our enemy. You see, that person that has come against you, and you thought they were a believer, but they were a false believer, like Paul had to go against, does God want that person to get saved? So your reaction to whatever it is that they do is going to mean tons towards bringing them to Christ. Am I making any sense? So the, the devil would like us to be getting mad at people. Because doesn't the devil want everybody to go to hell? I would say the answer to that question is a yes. He wants the people that he's using to go to hell. Why? It's a good question. Because that hurts God. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to take as many people. God didn't create hell for us. God didn't create hell for any people. He created hell for the devil. And so if, for every person that the devil can drag into hell with him, it hurts God. Because God created all of us to be his children. But unfortunately, all of us are not his children. In Philippians. Ah, I used to know how to read. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11, it says, Peter's talking, and it says, Be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil. Not your adversary, your neighbor. Not your adversary, your boss. Not your adversary, your wife. Not your adversary, your children. Not your adversary, your parents. You got me? Your adversary is the devil. And he's prowling around like a roaring lion. See, he's also an illusionist. So he's not really a roaring lion. But he's acting like one. Looking for anyone he can devour. I like another translation that says, looking for anyone whom he may devour. 
I like that, that translation because it gives the idea that in order for him to devour us, we have to give him permission. I don't want to give the devil permission, do you? But sometimes some of our actions, when we fall into the trap and start following the devil's ways instead of following God's ways, we are giving him permission to devour us. And we need to stop it. It says, resist him, firm in the faith. Similar to what Paul was telling Timothy. You know, that we need to, we need to stand firm in, in what we've learned and what we know, not what we feel. See, there's a whole campaign in the world to get us to go on what we feel. Well, what do you feel about this? It's all about the emotions. Somebody's house just burned down or their business just, just burned down. And there's rioting outside. Well, how do you feel? How do you think I feel? <laughs> what is wrong with you? No, you know, we feel bad. But how about, what do you think about this? Well, I think this is stupid. That's what I think about it. I think this needs to stop. That's what I think about it. They don't want to ask what we think. They want us to get sucked into emotions. Why? Because they can drag us around by our emotions. And the devil wants us to get into our emotions. But he says, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Now, we could stop there and go, well, so what? Tenth verse. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. So he's telling us you're only going to suffer for a little while. And then Jesus himself is going to come and restore you. I like that. He's not going to send an angel. Jesus himself is going to come restore us. I like that. And it says to him be dominion forever. Amen. Now on to Paul's thorn in the flesh. He had this thorn in the flesh and he prayed over and over and over again to, that God would take it away from him. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. My strength is made perfect in weakness. See, we, we need to remember that. We, you know, sometimes we're like, I'm not strong enough for this. I can't, I can't make it. Well, probably on your own, you can't. But when we're weak, we expose God's strength. Because when we get through persecution or famine or whatever it is that we get through, the glory goes to God. Because yes, I did not have the ability to do it, but God did. And we're only going to suffer for a little while. See, keep the, the devil's objective in mind. He wants us to quit. So what am I not going to do? What are you not going to do? We're not going to quit. Because it says, I told you we'd read the second half of Matthew 10, 22. The second half of the verse says, but the one who endures, which connotes some kind of struggle, the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. But I'm not any threat to the devil's kingdom. What's he messing with me for? Well, uh, that, that's what I ask. If you're no threat to him, then why is he so busy trying to discourage you and me? If we're not any threat to the devil, why is that what he seems to be doing to every Christian in the world? He's trying to discourage us. Why? Because he's afraid of you. He's afraid of you. He doesn't want you to find out who you are in Christ. 
Because when you do, you'll begin to tear down his kingdom, and he doesn't want that. But Jesus does want that. Jesus does not want you tearing down your neighbor. He doesn't want you tearing down your co-worker. He doesn't want you tearing down your Facebook friends. What he wants us doing is tearing down the kingdom of darkness. That's what he wants. But the devil has us so distracted. You know, so many Christians think that they're on a, a righteous indignation of some sort, tearing apart other Christians and other people. No, they're not on a righteous crusade. They're on the devil's business, discouraging their brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't want to be those people. Jesus tells us that he wants us tearing down the kingdom of darkness. And what Jesus did for us was he disarmed the devil's power. It says in Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities. Now, who are they? Well, we just read who they are. They're the ones who we're struggling against. The rulers and the authorities and disgraced them publicly. So he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. In other words, through the cross, we disarmed our enemy. We disarmed our enemy. So Jesus calls the devil an illusionist and a liar, and that his native language is lying. So that's what he has to resort to. He doesn't have any power over us once we realize who we are in Christ and what we have in Jesus. So what he has to do is he has to lie to us and he has to fool us into believing that what he says is true. Oh, God doesn't love you. That's why you're going through this persecution. <clears throat> lie. Not true. God loves you. He's always loved you. There will never be a time that God doesn't love you throughout all of eternity. Now, Jesus had a little conversation with Peter in Matthew chapter 16, 18 and 19, chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. He says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, or Petra, which means rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And this is important. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in, he in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. See, the battle, as we look back at, at Ephesians chapter 6, was it say, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness and against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So on earth here, we're fighting a battle that's going on in heaven. Does that make sense to you? That's why Jesus said it that way. He's given us the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever we bind on earth, I bind you devil in the name of Jesus. That's a real thing. And when we do that, he's bound up in the heavenlies where he resides. He doesn't reside in hell. He lives in one of the levels of heaven until the end of everything when he, he and his buddies all get thrown into the lake of fire. They don't have their asbestos skis either. He says, whatever you bind on earth, because we're here on earth, will have been bound in heaven. See, God knew we were going to ask that. So it's already been bound in heaven because we, because we bound it on earth. And whatever you loose on earth, we loose. We loose. <laughs> we loose the things of God. We loose the things of heaven, the things of the kingdom of God. Whatever we loose on earth, 
Lord, we want your power to reign. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we lose the powers of heaven. When we lose that on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. Read the book, This Present Darkness. It's a novel, so it's not true. But it's a good example of what happens when we pray. Like when we're praying today for our nation. Jesus said to the disciples in Acts 1.8, before he ascended to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. The word witnesses is the word for martyrs in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're talking about persecution. Jesus said, you're going to be my martyrs as you're witnessing in your hometown, in your county and, I mean, and in your country and in surrounding countries and to the ends of the earth. We're going to be witnesses. We're going to have the strength to stand up even under great peril. Have you ever wondered how those guys hold out when people were killing them? You know, I have a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Don't read it before bedtime, but... It, it talks about all the different martyrs that we know about. And it's been updated recently. Um, how did they have the strength? Well, we, we have the strength because he, he gave us the baptism with the Holy Spirit. He baptized us in the Holy Spirit. He gave us the power to be his witnesses. He gave us the strength, the fortitude, the endurance to even be his martyrs. It says in Luke 10, 19, look, Jesus is talking. I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Don't particularly want to do that. And over all the power of the enemy, nothing at all will harm you. You might say, well, these guys got harmed. You know, most of them were, all of them were martyred. Actually, it just didn't take on John. They, you know, they all were killed for, for Jesus. What do you mean nothing will harm you? See, what God's concerned about is where you're going to spend eternity and where I'm going to spend eternity. So, yeah, Paul got his head chopped off because he was standing for Jesus Christ. So in the long run, as he stepped into eternity, as his head fell into a basket, was he really harmed? He went to where we all want to be. God's concerned about the, the spirit you. Not so much the physical you. Because we all have to go through hardships. In this world you will have suffering. So the thing is, no matter what, stand firm to the end. It, because again, Matthew 10, 22, second half, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We need to endure. If there's, if there's persecution to come in the United States, like it is all over the, most of the rest of the world, we need to endure like the great people in Scripture did. We need to endure, and God's going to give us the strength through the Holy Spirit to do exactly that. It says in Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on all the terrible things that are going on around. Oh, people rioting in the streets. It's, it's, you know, all that kind of stuff. I don't need to be focused on that because my enemy is the devil. And what happens when we focus on all these things that are going on? COVID 19, there's people rioting in the streets. People are killing other people, and that's just terrible. I'm going to die. <laughs> when we focus on that, like the news wants us to, 
like a lot of the politicians want us to, like Windows wants us to, we're getting our eye off the main thing. See, we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith for the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. He's telling us to consider Jesus and everything that he went through so that we won't lose heart. So that we won't grow weary and give up. See, he's warned us ahead of time. Difficult things are going to happen to us. So when it does, we should just say, oh, that's okay. That's happening now. Is God going to take care of you? For your life's journey, God is going to take care of you. You're not going to step into eternity one minute sooner than God wants you to. In fact, you're not going to step into eternity until you finally get it right. You're not going to step into eternity until you have finished what God put you here to do. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And the devil can't come along and take that away from you. He can't. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. See, the only person who can keep you from winning in Christ is you. The only person who can stop me from doing the things God wants me to do is me. I've seen so many people talk themselves out of doing the will of God. And later on in their life, they were so miserable. If I had only, if I had, I don't want any what ifs when I, when I die. I don't want any if onlys. I don't want to look and see that all I built was wood, hay, and stubble. No, I want to see gold, silver, and costly stones. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I love this. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always excelling in the Lord's work. See, we could sit back and talk ourselves out of it. But Paul's telling us, and Paul lived in a time when persecution of the church was terrible. And he's saying, be steadfast, be immovable. Don't let anybody move you off of the, off of the ground that God has gained for you. He says in Philippians chapter 2, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Be immovable. See, some, some things in life, that we should be flexible on. Other things, not so much. And what God has told us to do, we should be immovable. Not willing to budge even an inch. Always excelling in the Lord's work. The writer of Hebrews says this, and I think the writer of Hebrews is Paul. But you can, I don't want to argue about it, but I just, you know, reading the book over and over and over again like I have, it just, it just seems like it's him. Um, <clears throat> and he says in the Hebrews 10, 39, but we are not of those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. We are not of those people who draw back. Another translation says shrink back. I like that word. Shrink back. <laughs> And are destroyed. See, the reason that we shrink back is we believe the lie of the devil. That if we stop doing the things that God wants us to do, that all of our problems will go away. 
It's the opposite of what a lot of people think when they get saved. All the problems are going to go away when you get saved. It's not like that. Somebody told me that before I got saved. They, they were completely wrong. How many of you would say things didn't get perfect after you got saved? Did they? No. But the, the, the thing that changed was we had somebody who is perfect walking with us every day, showing us how to live and directing us and leading us and guiding us. Is that true or not? And it says, we're not of those who draw back and are destroyed. <clears throat> but those who have faith and are saved. The devil's throwing all kinds of stuff at us. People calling us names. People laughing at us. People saying we're crazy. Maybe some of you have even lost your job because you were a Christian. You've lost friends because you tried to share Jesus with them. Family members think you're crazy. All kinds of stuff like that. But it, it's all part of what the enemy's doing. And his objective is to get you, to get me, to quit. So right now, all of us right here, right now, let's make a pact. No matter what the devil throws at us, we are not going to quit following Jesus. Can you make that pact? Can you make that pact? If you can, lift your hand up. Because everybody in heaven has just seen you raise your hand. Everybody in the heavenlies, that includes God and all the people that are in what we consider heaven, and the devil's buddies, they all saw you raise your hand too. It's one of the reasons that we are baptized publicly is putting the devil on notice that we're not serving him anymore. But today we're going to endure to the end because he who endures to the end will be saved. And we're not going to be of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We're going to be of those who believe and are saved. That's what we're going to be. That's the pact that we're making today. And you know what? We need to hold each other to that. You see me slipping? You need to come up and tell me in a kind way. I see you slipping? I need to come up and tell you in a kind way. Notice, in a kind way. When we say yes to God, like we are today, Satan's going to use persecution to try to, to try to stop God's work in us and through us. He's not just going to leave you alone. He's going to try to stop you. And he's going to try to convince you that if you stop serving Jesus, that the persecution, the problems, everything will stop. I guarantee you, they will just get exponentially worse. See, he's afraid of us because of the power that resides in us through the Holy Spirit to tear down his kingdom. You have the power to drag people out of his kingdom and into the light. You just have to realize that you do. You have the power in the name of Jesus, not in you, but in the name of Jesus, to stop the devil in his tracks. You. We need to realize it and use it. And since we know that his objective is to make us quit, that's the one thing that we must not do. I must not quit because he who endures to the end will be saved. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that you warn us over and over and over again in Scripture that we're going to be persecuted by people if we want to serve you. Because the devil's not going to just let us go and take his hands off and say, oh, okay, I guess I lost that guy. <clears throat> no, he's going to continue to be after us. But Lord, we want to be those people who don't shrink back. We want to be those people who rise up, 
through the power of the Holy Spirit and tear down his kingdom. And Lord, in fact, we make a pact today together. Everybody that's watching with us online, we make a pact that we're going to serve you from the bottom of our hearts for the rest of our lives. And we're not going to quit. And now with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, how many of you that are listening to this today are thinking, you know what? I, I haven't started following Jesus yet. Maybe you're listening to what I'm saying and you're, you're like, I, I think I missed a step somewhere. Well, if, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, I'd like to give you that opportunity right now. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of all of your sin. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you come from. Jesus died on the cross to save you. Why? Because he wants you to spend now and the rest of eternity with him. And he wants to walk with you through this life so that he can guide you because he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And you and I don't. So if you'd like to surrender to him so that you can receive that forgiveness, you're going to admit that you're a sinner. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer so that you can say that to Jesus, that you can admit that you're a sinner. And you want to make him the boss of your life. We call it the Lord of our life. But you're making Jesus the one in control of your life. And you're going to follow him like we're talking about today. We're going to follow him for the rest of our lives. If that's you, I'd like you to do something that might seem silly because I can't see you. But God can. Jesus can see you. So I'd like you, wherever you are, even if you're in a room full of people, I'd like you to lift up your hand and I'd like to pray for you. Could you slip your hand up and put it back down if that's you? Is there anybody else before we pray? All right, let's all pray this together because there, you, you might be in a room with somebody and they might feel funny about praying this. And if, if you're the one praying this for the first time, if I'm saying something that you don't want to say, then don't say it. But we're going we're gonna to admit that we're sinners. We're going to ask forgiveness of our sin. We're going to ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. And that's pretty much it. So everybody, let's pray this prayer out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus. thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sin. I ask that you forgive me of all of my sin. I ask that you'd come into my life. I ask that you come into my life. Be the boss of my life. Be the boss of my life. And baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And by your grace. And by your grace. I will follow you. I will follow you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. It's in your name. It's in your name. That I pray. That I pray. Amen. 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 Well, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you please tell somebody? If you don't have anybody else that you want to tell, you can go on our website, gracefellowship.net, and there's a place where you can email the pastor. Uh, email me. And let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And with that, uh, don't forget, next Sunday is communion. Also, I think I forgot to say this. Saturday, we're, we're setting our clocks back an hour. So it's fall, fall back an hour. So we get an extra hour of sleep. Yay! And next Sunday, we're going to meet live. So plan to do that. And uh, the online stuff will be a lot different. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.